coming up on the Can of Cribs podcast. My whole life has always been martial arts, medicine, stress, but like that's all I had. And if it did, did the job back then, uh, my two, um, Mazdin and um, Ziad were like, we think he's a cop, dude. And oh, I was like, fuck. no, I was like, dude, you're crazy. I was like, so I just lived there for like seven or eight months without electricity. Uh, we we're just, you know, consuming cannabis, training all day. Uh, when the sun went down, that was it. Cause you had like no light. And I was like showering in a river uh, behind the bamboo bungalows and stuff. 49% of all CCAA filings federally, so for the entire country of Canada, all bankruptcy filings, 49% of them have been cannabis companies. Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations, befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneer shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Cannacribs Podcast. The Cannacribs Podcast is brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have six categories we want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting off with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticulture Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Climate Control by Quest, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and helping us bring more knowledge to the world. If you want to support the Can of Crips podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. Hey, thanks for watching. Would you like your own Can of Crips episode? What about $20,000 in facility upgrades? Well, my friend, you're in luck. Sign up today for the Canna Cribs and Hawthorne sweepstakes for the chance to win. The sweepstakes ends April 2023, open to U.S. residents excluding Florida and New York and over the age of 21. You can check out the full sweepstakes rules on the application link below. I'll also post in the comments. Best of luck. Man, uh... Well, it all started so young ago, you know, uh, when I was real young. Um, I'm born and raised in St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, which is an island on the, you know, the most eastern um, coast or the, the most eastern point in all of North America here. Um, so, you know, I've always loved uh, medicine and, you know, I've always loved martial arts as well. And there was kind of a journey in my life where both of those were very intertwined and uh, I actually ended up having you know being pretty fortunate and i got the opportunity to leave newfoundland when i was 19 turned to 20 um 38 now and uh, i was really pursuing martial arts at that point um and i ended up living uh in asia and uh lived in like china for a year and that was probably like the first time uh, i didn't have access to medicine since i was probably like 13. um definitely been using medicine since 13 or 14 at this point. Uh, so that was pretty eye opening just seeing what other countries were like, especially where uh, I could get access to it in Hong Kong. But as soon as I went to mainland China, obviously, uh, it was a little more strict there. So that was pretty, pretty interesting. But I still pursued my love for martial arts there. Um, I actually lived next to where the original Shaolin Temple was, but it's uh, I was doing a type of Chinese uh, kickboxing called Sanda. And uh, did that for like a year but then the house that i was living in only had like curtains that were like beat it and stuff uh and the winter came so like there was snow going into my bedroom and stuff like that so i ended up uh bouncing out of there for a warmer place and uh went to thailand um and uh, i had a previously trained muay thai for a few years before that so uh, super familiar with uh, the martial art and that was more my vibe there the weather was a lot easier to handle um so I bunkered down there in Thailand for several years, and uh, that's when cannabis or the you know my medicine started uh, getting back in my life again, which was awesome. So my quality of life was just uh, that much better. Um, we were you know no matter where you were in Thailand, uh, down south or Bangkok or uh, up north, you could generally uh, access medicine. Um, but then uh, I had an opportunity to pursue um, a type of uh, martial arts training called uh, Kabri Kabrong, which is um, the like uh, the original form of Muay Thai. And it's essentially 
uh, more or less lost at this point. There's very few people that actually train it and teach it. They just treat uh, Muay Thai, which is, you know, the traditional sport, uh, their national sport in Thailand, essentially one of them. Um, so I pursued this guy three hours away uh, from Chiang Mai up in this place called Pai. Um, and it was a little village and uh, I asked him to train me. Um, and, uh, he wasn't really into that. And I noticed, Hey, this guy kind of smokes weed or, or, you know, he's, you know, he has medicine. I was like, so that's pretty cool. Maybe I can, uh, you know, approach him that way. And he kind of gave me the cold shoulder. Um, and, uh, I kept showing up every day trying to like, you know, Hey man, what's up? Can we do some training? You know, uh, maybe we can have some medicine. We can hang out. And, uh, he was having none of it. So I started, um, just like running alongside of him. He was doing like, you know, 10 kilometer <laughs> jog every day. So I just be like, Hey man, you know, like super appreciate the opportunity. If you let me train with you. And then I legit did that for like <laughs> weeks. Like, like I was like, it was like way too long. You know, I was really pushing my, my limits there. And eventually he like sat down and we chopped it up. And he just, you know, broke out like the stress, like that, you know, the stress you can get anywhere in the world, you know, like in, in uh, Thailand, uh, like they have like, you know, stress, like, like bricks, like just from Mexico and stuff, but it's from Thailand and Bangkok. And then they also have like legit land race uh, stuff, which is like from the hill tribe and it's like crazy. So at this point I've only ever seen uh, stress, you know, and Newfoundland didn't have much better than stress where I was from, you know, like we're, we're in the middle of nowhere back in the day and I was young. So uh, we're smoking some pretty low quality medicine at that point, which was also in Thailand. Uh, so he broke that out, but at least like we, you know, chopped it up and got along for the first time. So uh, medicine really like bonded that bridge. I made a really special bond there. Um, and we end up actually opening up a whole Muay Thai camp and uh, training other people in the village. Uh, a lot of Thai people, some foreigners came and stuff as well. And uh there's this weird dynamic in Thailand uh, with the hill tribes and the Thai people. So like the hill tribes uh, don't have a passport. They live in these regional areas. The Thai people don't really get along with them. There's, there's some tension there. Um, and uh, like bad tension, honestly, I haven't really seen m much good relations. And what you find are like a lot of expats that kind of live in Thailand and they're kind of in, in the medical side of the, the, the industry up there, you know, like the, uh, they, they kind of intermediary uh, between a lot of the hill tribes and even Thai people and other foreigners. So, um, this guy introduced us to the, uh, Korean hill tribe, uh, where they were just growing like the craziest land race stuff you've ever seen. It, it, it was fields of rice um and they just intermittently threw cannabis seeds in there and i mean it was all sticks and seed but these giant massive plants and at this point i've only ever seen like brick stress in thailand so i was like well that's kind of a step up i'm pretty impressed so um we were purchasing medicine there for like ten thousand baht a kilo and big garbage bags you know a couple pounds of it for like three hundred dollars or something and uh that was my life just like uh, medicine, martial arts, uh, living on this camp and, uh, just smoking Thai style, which is like a whole thing. Um, like it, it's pretty crazy actually. So like they'll either have the stress or this land race stuff and they start chopping it on a board and take out cigarettes and they strip the tobacco down and they mix it together and then chop it again. Uh, they make kind of like a big table, a uh, big pile in the center of the table and, uh, they pass around the bong. Uh, but you got to like clear the chamber fully and stuff and you can't pass it with like any smoke in the chamber at all. Otherwise you like really piss people off there and stuff. So it's kind of like you're all polite when you pass it. And yeah, anyways, it was, it was a trip because like, you know, my tolerance was low because I was only smoking shit weed because I was young anyways, uh, bad uh, medicine. And, uh, but adding into tobacco and stuff for the first time, I used to get like crazy high because I've never smoked cigarettes before. So I was doing that for like a couple of years. Um, and uh that came to a weird end because uh one of our neighbors actually uh who had a hostel next to us that rented it out to foreigners that would come and visit this uh, little village cut our electricity off and uh i went to like the town or like little village i was in and we tried to be like you know can we can we get our power back it's pretty rough mm -hmm. and they didn't really want to help us uh and so i just lived there for like seven or eight months without electricity uh, we were just, you know, consuming cannabis, training all day. Uh, when the sun went down, that was it because you had like no light. And I was like showering in a river uh, behind the bamboo bungalows and stuff. But it was fun. But at this point, 
uh, MMA started getting like super popular. So I wasn't doing really any MMA training, but I had done a ton of Muay Thai and I did Jiu Jitsu before. So all these people started showing up to Thailand uh, that I got to train with at gyms that were a lot of them were from Brazil and California. So I uh, met a lot of people from California then actually, and uh, MMA was just getting so popular. And eventually I kicked it off with a few people there that uh, made an intro to me um, with one of the Gracie families, Dracolino Gracie uh, in Belo Horizonte, uh, Brazil. So I end up staying with his friend, moving from Thailand to there, transitioned from Muay Thai into uh, doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Had an amazing coach and mentor very early on. Uh, you know, this is early 2000s. Um, so, you know, I progressed uh, through uh, Blue Belt there very quickly and uh, really loved the life there. And uh, the same stress, though, like all medicine was the same at this point. So, like, my whole life has always been martial arts, medicine, stress, but like, that's all I had. And if we did, did the job back then, um, and, uh, Brazil wasn't too different, you know, like, uh, we used to go into favelas sometimes just to have to get the, the stress and it was still the same, like, you know, stress brick weed and stuff. Um, and, uh, so I was smoking that for ages. And then, uh, I stayed there for just a little over a year. Um, and at this point I had been traveling since I'm 19, I'm like 25 at this point, hadn't visited home, um and i didn't go to university and i was actually really fortunate that my mom helped me get it get to asia and do the traveling stuff uh when i was pretty young you know and uh so this opportunity came up i was just like searching around on the internet and mma got so popular especially in california it's like the mecca of mma there especially in the heyday early early periods um this university called um, the American Sports University in San Bernardino, uh, California, wanted to recruit an amateur mixed martial arts team. And we're looking for coaches. They're looking for, uh, you know, kids to join the team. So they end up giving me a full ride scholarship to move to Cali, um, do some coaching, join the team, work with uh, the program and figure it all out. So I was like, man, it's probably a good opportunity. You know, I hadn't really thought I'd go back to school or try like any post-secondary um so you know my mom's obviously was like you're definitely doing that you know get your ass over there <laughs> um so sure enough i did because uh yeah, you gotta listen to her but um uh so that's when things really start to change in my life though so not right away but everything was about medicine and martial arts at this point i hadn't been growing medicine at this point but like everything i chased down every corner of the earth i went to uh, i was always looking for like mentors in medicine and in, in, in martial arts. So I'm in California. I land in, uh, this is 2008, uh, when Barack Obama got elected, I think I'm pretty sure it was 2008 and, uh, hadn't really been into America much. I've been to Florida a bunch of times. When I was really young, like going to Disney world and stuff, but I've been traveling for four or five years, uh, at that point. So I was super stoked, uh, to go to Cali and, uh, get into the, uh, jujitsu and MMA scene. Um, and so sure enough, I land in Cali. I don't really have any homies and stuff, but you got to figure out, you know, who's going to hook you up and who the plug is. And all That's right. That. And, uh, so I run into this cat. Oh man, fucking he was, he was so cool. So <laughs> Rashabar Singleton, um, uh, I kid you not. So his brother was, um, John Singleton, like the director who, uh, did boys in the hood. And they gave him a scholarship at the same university uh, just because I think he got, got out of jail and they're trying to like just give him an opportunity and shit. Um, so he was like my first homie that like hooked me up and he was selling me stress. This was like 2008. Uh, I've only smoked stress my entire life. And I was living next to the school dormitories in San Bernardino. It was a pretty fucking rough spot, honestly. <laughs> And, uh, like I, I was right next to, um, a penitentiary and I'd like get out of my con, like the little apartment I was in, I could see people like shooting hoops and stuff in the prison. And, and would, like, if I looked up, it was pretty crazy. Uh, but anyways, Rashabar Singleton used to come by my house all the time and just like sling me stress, which I was super used to, you know? And I was like, all right, this is cool. Got my hook up back. And I was probably doing that for like six or seven months. Um, and then I met some other dudes that were in the university too, um, a guy named Robbie and a couple of guys uh, and his friends. 
and they're from Orange County. Uh, and he was trying to do sports education. So he was like, you know, he was stoked to go and do this new sports university, but he was from a totally different walk of life. Like he was like, you know, such a bro and uh, just lived in Orange County his entire life. And I haven't really met anybody from Orange County at this point. Uh, and they're like, dude, and I, they came over to my place and we're like, I brought out my weed to smoke and I uh, started like chopping up some stress. They're like, what the fuck is this dude like you're still getting <laughs> stress what and i was like i didn't even understand like what they really meant because that's all i knew at this point you know and he's like no no way man like we got to get you met like a medical prescription and get you hooked up and i was like medical weed i was like what do you mean like i don't even know what you mean you know and uh so sure enough you know over the next couple of weeks i went and like i had like an actual appointment one back in like 2008 it was still the first year i was like living there and uh got hooked up said all the mma shit was hurting my uh my knees it was also easy to get um and i went into a dispensary for the first time um like and it changed my life you know what i mean like it like at that point everything was driving me from martial arts and i always had medicine to support this but that at that point when i walked in the first dispensary in southern california i was just like you know, old school jars everywhere, just flavors everywhere. And I hadn't seen anything. I'm just looking at stress my entire life. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? I'm just blown away, uh, smelling everything. And uh, I'm, I'm a super obsessive type of person. Like that's definitely what got uh, this whole project I'm in, in charge of now and found it uh, off the ground. But um, so my obsession flipped at that point. I was like, I need to know everything on how to grow this like what is medical cannabis what is this culture like i love this like i love like what the fuck is this strain what's the lineage of this like who grew this like or, like it had a story you know learning about like og kush for the first time and like you know all the lineage and stuff like that back in the day like and just chasing down the stories uh and getting on the forums so like that was a huge part of it like i went down this just rabbit hole um what's it called? The rollitup.org forums or whatever it was back in the day. I started putting like row journals on there. Uh, I found my first one the other day because I was just looking at it for this uh, interview. Um, and it was like 2009 uh, grow. So at some point in 2009, I had went down this rabbit hole and I was like, I need to learn how to grow. I need to know what medical collectives are. Uh, so I did my first grow. Uh, it was grape ape. It was the first strain I've ever grown, but it was a sick like perp strain from back in the day, Classic. you know, after, after exactly after GDP and like this came out, it was a little more exotic for the exotics that actually oh, yeah. came out. Yeah. So, um, I had that and like the first grow was super small, you know, it was like in a tent with like a 600 watt light or something and got like maybe a QP or something like that at most. Uh, but I was, it was super loud, like just, you know, I never even knew what terps were back then, but you, you smelled what the purple color was back then. You mm -hmm. knew what that was mm -hmm. for the first time, you know? And uh, so I was like, man, this purple shit is crazy. And uh, I, I knew how the collectives work. I knew what Proposition 215 was, and I wanted to get more involved. So I had a social security number to support my studies and stuff in, in, in the, for doing the scholarship there. But like, I, I didn't really know how to take the next step. So I was going into a smoke shop uh, in San Bernardino and I met these uh, brothers that own it, um, Ziad and uh, Mazdin and Eddie. Um, and I gave them some of my weed, uh, the great babe. And they're like, this shit's fire, dude. Like, you know, where, where did you grow this? And then I was like, yeah, man. And so I was super naive because this stuff just like blew me away. And at this point, to, to say that if I had an understanding of state legal versus federal legal and really how hot the scene was, because it was the Wild West back then, like I was naive. I was like this kid from Canada had been traveling, but I didn't really understand how you could get wrapped up real quick, you know? So I used to meet a lot of people because I wanted to and I wanted that in my life, but I was probably too open. So at least these homies were the first ones that were like, got me there, you know, they're like, okay, like let's do a collective. I'm going to help you set up. And we opened um, a not-for-profit, but mutually beneficial collective back in like 29-ish, you know, like what, after my first or second grow. Um, and so we had the collective open. I started putting more lights up in my condo and then we're flipping the second grow. Uh, we had to get more patient. So I remember I was like, okay, well, you know, every time we went to a collective, they'd give you like a free joint or something like that. And you sign away your medical script and then it allows them to grow the six plants. So I was like, let's do the same thing. You know, we'll, we'll give out some free weed on weed maps or something and get a bunch of people signed up. 
So we do that. We get on Weed Maps, come up with a collective name, which was uh, Ocean Grown Caregivers Collective, OGCC, like way back in the day. And we were just doing some like inland empire deliveries, got our patient base up. And so I had more patients than the plants I wanted to grow then. So I was like, all right, you know, let's shut it down for a bit. Let's flip this next crop. Uh, and this was the, the biggest one to date. And we're always staying just under like 99 plants. And so at this point, I transitioned my growing style as well, just to kind of fit the uh, Prop 215, um, like not the limits, because it wasn't Prop 215. I guess it was, you could get federal attention or indictments if you're above 99 plants, I think it was. So we tried to maximize 99 plants in one one condo as best as we could uh, not go over that. So we actually end up going into uh, deep water culture and a recirculating system after, because you were just growing these monstrous trees, you know, they're huge, um, nothing like to grow now. Um, so anyways, started flipping that one and, uh, you know, I was getting familiar with all the genetics. I think, um, back then I was growing a lot of sour D and chem dog. Cause I was obsessed with like the old school stuff that went into making some of the, the OG cuts and then, uh, and a pre 98 Bubba I had too, like old school flavors that you'd never grow anymore, you know, like the, the real old ones. Um, so that was fun. And, uh, so here we are. And we're looking to go a bit bigger. We need a second condo, maybe. Do we need a warehouse? Like, how do we scale up to a hundred lights? Cause like it was working out, the product was good. Uh, we'd be able to put it in the dispensaries if we couldn't put it in our patient network and put it on consignment and stuff. There was a place called um um uh, Kushmart in downtown LA, like way back in the day. Um, and it was one of the first dispensaries I went to that had like a card where you could like scan in and stuff. And it wasn't just like a security guard who was like scary looking. And um, I remember putting some of the cannabis there on consignment and uh stuff like that. So, anyways, we wanted to figure out how we could go to the next step. And uh I was super open on the forum. So this is where things got like my naiveness, probably naivety like came to show. So I got really engaged on these like roll it up forums and talking to people and just showing videos of what we're doing. I was posting on YouTube and all of that in like 2010 ish. Um, and then some guy hit me up uh, to join the collective and he was like, you know, I can help you scale up. And his handle is Mendo bro. And is from up North, you know, um, this dude, and we're just talking for like a month, I'd say. And then all of a sudden he like finds this awesome connect on all these cheap lights to help us like get to that, like warehouse a bit quicker and things like that. Um, so everybody at the collective that was running it, uh, with me, they were cool. You know, I was like, I could use another hands to help me figure out this, you know, you guys are putting the money in, uh, they were cool with it. So we came down, showed up like a few weeks later and, uh, was cool at first, but he had like a pet dog and it was like super obedient. I thought nothing of it. It was a German shepherd. And, uh, this guy was just super helpful and making my life easier, but he was living in my condo. Mm -hmm. And uh, my two, um, Mazdin and um, Ziad were like, we think he's a cop, dude. And oh, I was like, fuck. no. And I was like, dude, you're crazy. I was like, we're growing like 90 plants in a condo. Yeah, we want to go bigger. You know, Why like, would we're he waste not really his resources. Exactly. Like, how, like, I was like, you guys are tripping. I was like, I refuse to believe this. I was like, you know, like, there's oh, no way no. that that is the case. So I, I keep going and they're kind of reserved, but it's my risk because I'm the one, it's my condo that the collective was registered to and I was doing all the growing there and stuff like that. So like, they're like, listen, man, whatever, you know, but like, we're pretty wary. And uh, so anyways, things go on for like a week or two and he helps me set up like a, like CO2 in two of the rooms. He finds like uh, regulators and all this shit for me for dirt cheap. And I'm like, man, this guy's fucking awesome. You know, I'm getting all these lights for dirt cheap. Everything's just so easy now. Um, and then one day I go out with uh, my two dudes um, in the collective and it's probably like 1 a.m. when I come home. I wasn't out that late. Oh, he robbed and you. No. Well, I wish he robbed me. Fuck. So I come back and he's only in my life physically for like two weeks or something at this point. We've talked on the internet for a month or two. And I don't even really know his last name. You know, I know him that well and uh, definitely don't know this dude's birthday. And he's, he's older us than us back then. I was probably like 25, 26 now. So he was like in his thirties and he was like, thanks, bro. And I was like, like, as soon as I walked in the house and he was like, really like in my face and stuff. And he was like, thanks, bro. Thanks. I was like, well, what's going on? And you got to remember like back then I was like training full time still as well. And I was like, you know, taking HGH and like all like fucking juice and stuff. 
So I didn't put up with much shit usually, but this was super weird. Like I was like totally caught off guard and I was like, oh, like, I don't even know what he's talking about. Is this like some mental shit? Um, and he's like, it's my birthday, man. And I was, and I was like, oh, like, what do you mean? But he meant like an hour ago, it rolled over to be his birthday. Right. And he started explaining that. And I was like, this is so fucking crazy, you know? And he's like, freaking out at me in my face and stuff and then his dog is like barking like crazy like just fucking going like a lunatic and i start to lose my cool and i'm like i have no idea what you're talking about i don't know your birthday like how would you think i know that i was like you're in my house you're sleeping here for free i was like what the fuck is on the go and his dog is like going crazy like crazy and he's not even like really saying much it's me getting more heated at this point and because like, i kind of like just i flipped over at that point where i was like this guy's in my house making me feel weird like this. Um, and then the dog like is like next to him and I fucking boot the dog and like go to push him and he, all, all hell fucking breaks loose. And he like, he's like grabbing his dog uh, and he's almost near tears at this point. I was like, holy fuck. Like it was just absolute maximum yeah. tension. I was like, what the fuck is going on? Um, so I leave, go away for a few hours. And I'm like, this is crazy. Um, and I have university and shit the next day. So I come back uh, a few hours later, he's gone, he's ghosted, but all this shit is still there. Like his, his, uh, like, uh, in, in around his, like everything. Right. And, uh, I was like, this is crazy. So I go to school the next day, tell all the guys, I was like, dude, like, it's definitely not a cop. I was like, but this guy's crazy. You know what I mean? We got to get him out of the collective. I, I'm afraid to go back to my house. I was like, what can we do? So the guys meet me after university and we like drive up there together. Um, at this point I was living in Marino Valley, like uh, 30 or 40 minutes away from my university um, in uh, San Bernardino. And it was right when that, like uh, the housing bubble uh, collapsed and stuff in 2008. So I bought a killer condo that had somebody living it for like two months and we just blew it up plants like everywhere. Um, anyways. Um, so uh, these guys drive back to that condo with me in this gated community and uh, he's not there at least all this shit's gone. He stole some of the equipment, like the CO2 regulator and some of that stuff. And uh, we're like, at least he's out of my life. Cause that was fucking a trip. Like it was the weirdest stuff ever. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I felt like I felt really naive at that point too. I was like, man, maybe I opened up a bit too much on the internet. Cause I was like reaching out to homies to like move into my house to grow hundreds of plants, you know? Like, so I was like, maybe that wasn't the best idea. So we clamped down a tiny bit. Um, but this guy knew everything, right? Like he was on the inside. He helped set up 90 plants and then took some equipment and bounced. Uh, so he definitely knew our flip dates. He knew when the harvests and all that stuff were, and he knew where we were trying to put a second uh, set of 90 plants at another condo. And he knew the warehouse we were looking at and all that stuff. But I put it out of mind, didn't care about it. A couple months goes by um, and I'm actually, it's, like Super Bowl, it's, it's somewhere around the Super Bowl. I remember that. Um, it may have been like Super Bowl day. Like I'm, I'm up at my friend's house. The guys that got me at this point a year or two ago, like a couple years ago, into medical cannabis, Robbie and them. And like at this point, like now I knew everything about all the cannabis. I was growing it, you know, I was hooking up some of the friends and like, you know, it was, it was, it was fun and I was having a great time uh, out there. And the condo never had much finished cannabis in it. Uh, and it had like no money and it just had our like patient records and things like that. So anyways, I'm up there and this was back in the day. So I, I didn't have an iPhone or anything. It was like, so it wasn't like that classic Nokia, but it was like a skinny version of the Nokia. I still have it. Cause like, I'm afraid like this dude's going to like pop back on my life one day, you know? <laughs> so I still got, I found it before this interview and I was like, man, this fucking phone. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, I get this text, like shitty old text message from back in the day. And it's like, look outside your window, bro. And I could just hear his voice, man, the way he talked. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, like, I'm not there. And he's like, well, we're coming in to get you if you don't come out. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And so I show it to my friends. I'm like, man, I got to get back there. You know, I got all these plants there. Like shit's going to, he's got, I thought he was just ripping me. You know, I thought he was just ripping the crop. Um, and they're like, man, you shouldn't go back. Like, like, you know, like we're staying here. You can stay here, but I wouldn't go back if I were you. So I ended up going back the next day, sleepover um, at the guy's house in uh, Newport. And uh, I'm driving back, you know, super convinced at this point, all my shit's gone. He stole all the weed. We're not going to get to the warehouse anymore. Like that was our next big thing to get a lease to like move up the collective and all that stuff. And uh, so I get there and there's fan leaves like 
outside the front of the house, like ripped up and shit. And I'm like, oh man, he fucking, why would he do that? He was just like a malicious prick. You know, he was just destroying everything. Then I look at the the door and I'm like, hmm, like that shit was battering ramp, like professionally. It was like oh, okay. off the hinges, right? DA, um, like, oh, something like what that. What the fuck is going on? And then I start walking up the staircase and there's just a card there for a detective. And I'm like, oh fuck, it's the cops. I've never had any trouble with the police in my entire life at this point. That's why I was so naive about all of this shit. And uh, I just remember like that sinking feeling, you know, and I was like, what the fuck? I was like, everything I was doing is legal. Like, I was like, man, like I dedicated my life to learning this plant, learning how to grow. Like I was giving medicine to patients and I was legit giving medicine to patients. We had some shit on the side that was surplus, but that's, we were allowed to do it back then, you know? And, uh, but whatever. So these guys knocked the place. And they, they hit it hard. Like it was like uh, everywhere there was a door because they probably assumed that I was like hold up in there because I just turned my phone off and uh, pretend, you know, I was like fucking deal with this tomorrow. Um, like I don't, I like, I assume it was like a flashbangs and shit because like every, like all of the, um, like the hinges had like giant, like black, like explosion marks out of it like that. Like it was ah. like gunpowder, like going like in, in all the closets and like the walk-in pantry in the bedroom, all of the grow rooms, like all my doors used to have a big prop 215 like thing on it with my, like uh like a little bullshit, like piece of paper I put there, you know, all that was like ripped down my uh like couch flipped upside down cut like everywhere it could cut to like Looking look for, for shit. Yeah. 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 Whatever they could find, you know? Um, so I think that's, I was super lucky cause I had no money there. I had almost no finished product, um, and just patient records, but they took everything, like all my grow equipment, anything that had like memory, like they took memory cards, um, t- the cameras. Cause this was before smartphones. So like all my like pictures and shit living in Asia, like the majority of them were with me on this like small hard drive and stuff. And they took all of that, but I still don't have it obviously. And uh, so like, I have like Facebook pictures and memories or like my space, I guess it was back then. And uh, so anyways, they took anything that held memory, all of the grow equipment and uh, what the, the fucked up thing was, was I had this little shitty beaker bong cause they took glass and paraphernalia and shit as well. Like, like uh, I don't know, okay, this is funny. Do you, do you know, remember the original dab rigs called skillets? I do not know. Oh man. So back then like dabs were like just coming more onto the scene where people were like whipping up wax and making butter and stuff like that. Or like trying to do it with shatter. And anyway, so like this was hitting all the dispensaries there. Um, but anyways, I had this big fancy rig. That's the first version of a dab rig where in the down stem, you put an upside down umbrella that's hand blown. And then you have a big titanium skillet here and it's just giant. You got like an industrial torch. So people were hitting like <laughs> white, white hot dabs. It's the only thing people knew then, right? You're just like, oh. yeah. And it would call a skillet because it would dance everywhere on the flat part and try to suck up through the umbrella. Anyways, this shit cost me like so much money because I had like a sick one. Uh, and they took all of that shit, but they left this little like beaker one that was like almost like crack pipe material. Like, cause I was like, I must have had to get it on the go. You know what I mean? Uh, so they left that and they found a turkey bag that must have had some shake or some shit in it. And they like, you could tell they dumped it out on a counter, had the beaker bong and there was like handprints in it where they were like making bowls, like whoever the entry team was or whatever like that. And they obviously were like ripping bongs what? there and it was clear as day. Like you could tell that like, they dumped the weed out, made and packed it, y- used that bong, which I hadn't used in like years. You know what I mean? Fuck, I was like, these guys, Imagine just, if like, you had a camera in the you. corner exactly like, like camera exactly <laughs> like they were just like i would i can only imagine it man like they were I, I like they were probably rolling people up all the time like this you know what i mean i'd have not like like actually falling through the charges and just robbing stuff so i never had any legal issues at this point and i'm super naive i'm still looking at this card i'm taking all this in and i call the detective i'm like hey dude my name is chris crosby um you know i'm part of the ocean grown kiggers collective i was like you know, what do we need to talk about? And he was like, why don't you just come on down and we'll talk about it. And I was like, okay, I mean, that's fine. They don't seem very angry. And so I called the dudes like back the, the, the two dudes at San Bernardino in the smoke shop. And I'm like, man, I'm just going to go down there and see if I can straighten this shit out. You know, they seem like half friendly and they're like, no dude, what the fuck? Like, it's a like, trap. No. It's a honeypot, yeah. bro. Don't exactly. go. Exactly. Like, dude, you're so stupid. They're like, just stay in your house. Just stay in your house. They know where you live. They'll come and get you if they want you, but don't go there. I'm like, okay, fuck. 
So then I'm like, I got to tell my parents and shit. Cause I'm four years in a university. My, I like, it was going to like, I, I was doing my course slow. So it's going to take me at least like five plus years to graduate at this rate. So I was past the fourth year, had most of my courses well done. And then I'm like, am I getting like kicked out of the country? Am I going to fucking jail? Like what in the fuck is going on? So I call my mom uh, and I explain everything. She knew that I was like a medical cannabis patient, but she was like, you opened a collect what? what what the fuck are you doing you know it's just like you're gonna go to fucking jail in the states you know like everyone's freaking out then i'm like oh god so she gets you know she's like all right we gotta get a lawyer for you that's the first thing so i end up like going to la and i forget this guy's name but like this was like when raids were hot and stuff happening all the time so this guy was like capitalizing on that he was like a weed specialty lawyer and he used to be the former district attorney of of la so he was like now he had a weed practice $10,000 $10,000 fucking retainer just, just to get this guy to like talk to you. Right. So, all right, boom. He hears the story. I tell him everything. He's like, okay, don't worry. He literally calls the cops like in front of me and it's like, okay, we represent Osh Bro Kigger's collective. You know, we, we got to see what the misunderstanding is here. And they never, they like six months go by and don't hear anything. I'm still finishing school and stuff like that. And uh, my paranoia, though, is just like <sighs> ratcheting it up. And a lot of my homies and shit like bail. Like the collective wasn't a collective anymore. Like, you know, like I, I had like I was probably growing like 20 plants in the house and stuff because it was like my my medicine and I was trading it for other stuff and things like that. Uh, but I wasn't doing like 99 plant grows and stuff anymore and trying to get to the warehouse. Um, and the the two original homies that helped me start it were still there. But then I started getting like pretty crazy. So like I had to get a new laptop again, try to finish school. And I remember this website, it's called like radioreference.com. I don't know if it still exists. And you can like hone in on any like uh, broadband like frequency, I guess. So I used to listen to the Merino Valley like PD like frequency that anybody can just hear like emerge, they can hear fire departments sure. or whatever and stuff too. And so I'd have this laptop and I'd be like, rolling up swishers, smoking blunts, just like with this laptop in the background, people would come and visit me at my place. And they'd be like, dude, what the fuck is that? And I'd explain it. And they'd be like, dude, you're, you're tripping. Like you have to stop this. And like slowly nobody hung out with me. I was like by myself, uh, you know, like just living and hold up in this place that was still torn to shit. I had like 20 plants left. All the other stuff was just ripped off the walls. Uh, my HVAC system was destroyed because they like I like I replaced it for this the grow and stuff. It was like the condo was a mess, and uh, I felt so shit, dude. Like I was um, like convinced something horrible was going to happen. So I had like a little go bag uh, with money, my passport. I was like, you know, I can get to Mexico and Canada, like something, you know, like because I wasn't going to American jail and nobody would communicate with me. And my lawyer was like, look, like you're, you're golden, you know, like just, just relax. This is uh, nothing like this gets really taken care of, but it looks like they're not pursuing anything. Um, and I was like, well, do I get my stuff back? Like all my memories, like all the, all the lights, like, you know, what's up? Like, and he was like, honestly, I wouldn't, he was like, you know, like you should just finish university and fucking probably keep moving forward and just, uh, you know, not, not really dwell on this right now. And he, ba- he was like, you've been professionally robbed. He was like, I've seen this. This is what they do. Like, they're like that grow equipment was another grow that they knocked up, you know, and the, the, the lights and the pictures and everything that this guy showed you Mendo bro, like that was other grows that they knocked, you know, like that was like, uh, like that's what they do, you know. Like these guys are one foot in, one foot out. It was basically what he was saying. Dirty, it was like dirty cops, exactly. Like you know, sometimes they let some of the grows go, like because they're like half involved with it. They're probably taking points or like moving packs or whatever, grabbing some packs. So like some deal works out. Because this guy was not just like straight up, and they just disappeared, like vanished, like no charges, no anything. Took all my shit. Uh, reached the statute of limitations, like, you know, and, but I, I, I got to the point where I was so fucked up in California, like five years in, nobody was really hanging out with me because I was like a mess. And uh, I just came home and uh, I was like, fuck, dude. At the, actually, I came home almost the, shortly after the first or second ever recreational vote happened when I was there. So uh, it was still Prop 215 medical and they were going for a rec vote and I was convinced it was going to happen. I was like this one light that I had. I was like, I'm going to stay in Cali. I'm going to ride into legalization rack here way back in the day. 
Um, and I had a system designed. Uh, there used to be this place called Discount Hydroponics way back in the day. And I was on this forum, like I, I like kind of group sourced making this old school hydroponic system that people used to do um, ebb and grow like flood buckets with a brain bucket back in the day in California from this Discount Hydroponics. And I added aeroponic sprayers in it and gutted out all of the, uh, the, the medium. So it was more like a DWC um, with sprayers. And I did it did a grow in it. And they're like, this is a smart system. We could make a four plant system, make it good for like recreational if it passes. Uh, and I was, that was my next, I thought that was my next big opportunity. It was like patent a little system for rec. Um, and then the rec vote just failed. And I was back into paranoia and all like fucked. And I just uh, end up coming back to, to Canada, basically with my tail uh, between my legs. And I didn't even graduate university. I had to graduate like probably a year later in Canada because I just asked him to do all the classes remotely because my head was just so fucked up. And the, the university was cool. They actually worked with me because, uh, you know, they, 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 you know, I was one of the students that stuck with it. It was a really new university. Like with this, uh, it was only like, I was one of the first students the year that I went there and stuff. So at this point, I've been using medicine since I'm 13 or 14, traveled the world using it and i transitioned into this beautiful phase where i got just down i went down this rabbit hole of prop 215 culture that shaped my life and who i am today um but it was like i thought i was done i thought like you know i thought i was gonna be part of this big cannabis movement you know and it just felt like it just left me behind like destroyed um and i came back home and i stopped uh, using medicine for the first time um i guess that was like maybe 2015 ish something like that no no 2014 uh, yeah, going into 2014, I would have uh, moved back home, um, stopped, stopped consuming Canada, uh, you know, medicine for the first time, which was crazy. I was like, you know, I'm going to have to do a whole life change here. Um, and my family had uh, one of their family businesses is an offshore oil and gas um, predates us joining Canada when Newfoundland was its own country. Um, so I always had an extremely strong amount of family pride and knew I wanted to create something as an entrepreneur at some point at home. Athena offers a full product range of liquid and powdered nutrients, integrated pest management, and sanitizing and disinfectant products that have been researched, validated, and developed specifically for use in cannabis cultivation from home growers all the way to large scale licensed producers. Their newest range of products, the Athena Clean Line, are a cultivator's frontline defense against pathogens, pests, fungus, and mildew. And it's a great solution for any scale cultivation. Reset your room to its full potential with Clean Line from Athena Nutrients. To learn more, visit them on Instagram at athena.ag or on their website at athenaag.com. Um, so, you know, I was, I was back. I stopped consuming medicine for the first time since I was 13 years old. You know, I'm like uh, 30 or something at this point. Um, and uh, so that was crazy. You know, like I, I just tried to cut it all and do a complete 180 and change who I was to everybody around me. Uh, and that became difficult too, because I was gone for so long and I live in an Island. Everybody has the same friends since like, you know, high school, that's it. And it's very friendly here, but there's like clicks, yeah. you know, it's only 500,000 people on this Island. And like, you, you kind of lost touch with, with all the original homies and stuff like that. But like, I'd still see them and still be with them, but there's so much I missed out on. You just don't get the jokes and stuff. Um, so, and at work, it was difficult too, because I had something to prove because I knew I had a lot of spirit to, to do things like what I did in California felt great. And I was pretty young when I did it. Uh, and I wanted to create something here and I knew it couldn't be cannabis. So it had to be this oil and gas opportunity with my family business. And like, I was like, you know, a lot of people wouldn't have known me. I would have come in with the last name Crosby and the Crosby group and, and all of that. And they'd be like, you know, who is this Chris guy? Um, and I, I think like, I was so like assertive that I, I wanted to show people I was worth the opportunity that it also made it hard for me to like, um, prove that like it came off a bit difficult and I, I just wasn't happy there. You know, like I, I, I was, I wasn't using medicine anymore and I was just doing more school and I was just on the straight and narrow trying to prove to everybody I could do this legit job. Um, and then I was doing that for two years. 
and legalization wasn't a thing, wasn't really being talked about. And uh, then Justin Trudeau started campaigning um, for being voted in, you know, uh, and that large part of that was legalization platform. Uh, so this like just this birdie like came alive on my shoulder, you know, this little voice. And I was like sitting in my desk at the oil and gas job. And I was just like, man, like, what am I doing? Like, you know, I have to do this. And I started doing some research around what was the pre-legalization um, licensing system, which uh, in Canada, which uh, was the ACMPR. So it was a medical program. And it was very ambiguous how you actually get a license from Health Canada. There's no digital system at this point. It was all um, paper trail and the applications were, you know, thousands of pages and you send it to a government locator address and then maybe they get back to you. So what was happening in this early day was like people were figuring out how to just get into the queue to get like a cultivation um, or like a cultivation or processing license in the early day. Um, and there was consultants everywhere, you know, so I didn't have enough money. I was like, you know, I'm just making a fairly meager salary trying to prove myself in this company. Um, and consultants are like, oh, you know, give me a hundred grand. We'll figure out how to get you licensed and your company and all of that. And everybody, this was like the creation. Everybody knew Canadian legalization was approaching. So the banks were out, you know, it was hard to capitalize a project, even though I knew what I knew. Uh, and I knew how to grow and I knew what the right strains and the flavors were. And I just knew the culture. So I was like, I got to find a way to make this work. And I, I started researching other facilities. And one of the things that really let me know that like I have an opportunity to get into this game in, in, in Canada was all these facilities were growing in soil and like not good soil. Like they were like, you know, thrips everywhere and just like old school, like no defoliation done properly, like no canopy management, just plants all over the place. Uh, nothing impressed me. So I was like, man, we were more advanced than this in California in 2008. I was like, this is like how the hell, how the hell are they even get away with this? So I, I kept like that reinforced my interest. I was like, you know, we're going to build a built for purpose uh, ground, like the state of our facility with the whole intent is cannabis cultivation and processing, you know, and multiple iterations of that project failed, you know, obviously, because I tried to find someone who was interested, um, you know, attract the money for it. And in Canada, there's no banks in at this point. Like the only people that were raising money for these projects were using the capital markets, um, some private investment, hedge funds. You know, you had to have some type of financial connection outside of a tier one financial institution, essentially, which that was a hard part. And it's still a stain um on canadian legalization now there's so many people that are disenfranchised that are passionate about the plant and the industry and advocates for legalization that got left behind because no banks are in it didn't matter if you had a business plan it didn't matter where you came from what what you knew like what experience you had it was about knowing a bay street banker and being able to put up a bunch of smoke and mirrors and come out the newest terminology you know your funded capacity when this place gets built you're going to grow this much canada this much medicine and uh so i knew how to play that game enough like i like talking um and i like faking it till you make it and i knew in the back i knew more about growing than a lot of these people so i kept shopping the project around kept shopping the project around um and eventually it got shaped up to a point um when uh we had no no licensed producers or cultivators in my province okay so we are the only uh, province in Canada with no participation on the job side for the industry. And then Canopy Growth came to the province out of nowhere. Um, and I was like plodding along, talking to the city about what zoning I would need for a mm -hmm. cannabis cultivation facility. And I was the first person they've ever talked to about that stuff. And I knew that based on the conversations I was having. Um, but then all of a sudden there was a big provincial announcement that, you know, we're going to partner with Canopy Growth. They're going to build uh, this 100,000 square foot facility, hire 200 people um, and get into an employment creation, basically contract with the provincial government. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I was like, you know, like, they of course it? they are. Yeah. I was like, fuck. I was like, how can I get this opportunity? You know, like I was like this. They, they, I've been working on this for years, you know, and I got this experience. Um, and I just kept putting it together. And then eventually, uh, my parents were very supportive at this time. The Crosby group, like the bigger company that, uh, was like a multi generation business. They had nothing to do with this because oil and gas and medicine was very, very regulated. Yeah. Dis yeah. Yeah. So, but my mom 
uh, I came a medical patient in Canada. So working towards this the whole time, I had a whole medical grow with a hundred plants and I was pheno hunting for years. Cause I knew one day I was going to get this license. Uh, but I had the medical grow at my mom's I registered there. So all this time I've been teaching her how to grow and she's come over this hill where she saw me lose everything because of cannabis when I came back. And now she's like helping me grow cannabis and she's helped me try to find other investors. Cause she believes in this project now at this point, you know? Um, and we finally do find other investors. It was another two families uh, who have generational businesses, family businesses as well, um, that came aboard and uh, you know saw what I had to offer. Um, they believed the sales pitch, um, and it got a little easier to sell because canopy growth growth just struck this big deal with the province. You know what I mean? So they're like, okay, this is legitimate. Like there is infrastructure to be built here. There are jobs to be created, and the government's interested in the province participating in this. So. Uh, they they helped that conversation, even though I was very early trying to get that started. Um, I could gain some validity that way, no doubt. So we started going to the provincial government and, uh, you know, I ATIP, like we have a thing called ATIP, which is like an access to information policy for any government contracts. Like I was ATIP in government so I could get like, you know, their contract with Canopy to see exactly how it works and some things like that. it. Yeah. Um, and I was like, this is doable, you know, like if they're going to give this company an opportunity to build a new facility, but bring in cannabis, uh, bring in medicine from another facility they have out of province. Uh, and because that immediate supply with legalization was one of the upsides to the province, they guaranteed that. And then this part changed everything because that guaranteed supply, they allowed Newfoundland, my province to be canopy to become vertically integrated. So they gave them like six or seven retail licenses, oh my gosh. which there's like nobody in Canada at this point where a lot of the provinces are completely disconnected that value chain. There's no vertical integration. If you're a licensed processor, um, a licensed cultivator, you cannot retail in most provinces. They've really- uh, it's province run retail, that. right? A lot of it is. Some of it's private, some of it's public and government run, uh, but even the private run ones, they're basically like no LP, no licensed producer ownership. So it's really hard in Canada to connect with the smokers because not only half of them felt like they didn't get to be part of legalization, now like the people making the weed don't like have brands really. They don't have retail. Yeah. So not like they don't get that reaction. They don't have the like, feedback loop. Exactly. Exactly. So that this was when integrators get, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I saw this as a great opportunity. I was like, we need to pursue this vertical integration. For me, cannabis was always regional. Like even when you're in Cali, like, you know, uh, what people were smoking, like when I was in the beach cities and stuff, like there was people who had uh, like the Pluto, like the planetoids came out, you know, he had like Venus OG, Mars OG, Earth OG. And then like over here, like, you know, they're more into the perps and like the headbands and everything was regional, you know? So to me, you needed to be vertically integrated in your region, reflect how the community smokes. And I was like, this Makes is sense. something we have to do. Um, so we pushed so hard um, and it came down to this. The government was really great to work with. They're like, look, you have experience. We will recognize that in a new industry. You have an investor group who has employed thousands and thousands of people in Newfoundland at this point throughout the generations. So they had to believe that the project could get funded privately through this group. Um, and uh, so they entertained it. But they're like, look, it's going to take you like two years to build this facility. We need a supply now. And the reason why Canopy has this contract they and they can bring open it over. stores. Exactly. So I was like, all right, how can I fix this? How can I game plan this? And uh, so I went out in the market. Now with the possibility of getting this contract, having a license number from Health Canada, actually having investors around me who believe me now. And I went back out on that national stage um, and only the big publicly traded companies were like building infrastructure and, and doing supply agreements uh, at this point. So I, I went around to a whole bunch of them um, and, you know, like uh, I wear a track suit every day at work now, but back then <laughs> I had to wear a, uh, you know, I had a blazer and I was yeah. like, you know, just, I'm good at faking it till you make it. Trust me. And um, you had to do a road show. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I found a group that did believe in me and uh, they were already a licensed producer, had a facility, and they came in and partnered with us originally to say to the government, look, like we will supply the cannabis. You give Atlantic Cultivation their retail stores now so we can supply the cannabis to it. Let them build their facility, which will create the primary source of the jobs in the province. 
uh, but let them open up retail now. So as soon as legalization hit, we scored that document up, started nice. construction, um, and then we opened up our first store in 2019, uh, which now is the highest grossing store in, in my province. Like we do like sometimes $25,000 days there. Uh, we're doing millions of dollars out of that location. And it allowed me to go into the community and interact with the smokers and tell them what Atlantic was going to be, tell a bit about my story um, and just try to bolster up that regional community around us. Um, so by the time uh, we actually got licensed, um, I had six stores open, six stores open, supplying partners cannabis into them at this point. And I actually brand it and create it white label brand. So like they would supply cannabis, but we were one of the first companies several years ago that made a white label. Like people weren't doing that then. So I'll, we're very regional here. Like Newfoundland has a very different culture than, than the rest of Canada. So our brands were very eclectic and very localized. Um, so we, one of them is Crooked Dory, which is like a type of boat that people are in here. Um, and then uh, like another one's called Naked Mummer, which is mummering is an old tradition here. Um, so we white labeled those, one of the first brands to ever get white labeled, come into a province from another facility, but represent a local brand from a local to be licensed producer, um, had that in the market. And then, uh, it was always a plan. As soon as we get this thing built and we transition, we're going to get, you know, bring the brands back over here and then connect the vertical to that whole chain in the province, you know? Um, so that was, you know, going well, the cannabis industry obviously was already starting to compress at this point. There was a very few people still ongoing with new construction. We were still gung ho full bore, uh, convinced that what we were going to do, uh, the facility was a $32 million build out, uh, which was a very substantial chew, um, for was, three families. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I bet. Yeah. Walk me through those numbers. What was the the square footage of that facility? Yeah, totally. So it's a built for purpose facility. Um, that's the first floor is ninety thousand square feet. Fifty five thousand square feet of it is fully licensed and active now. Um, and in that fifty five thousand square feet, we have um, eight flowering rooms, two bedrooms, one mother and clone room. Uh, in two cultivation corridors that are completely separated as well, just for biosecurity and uh, IPM uh, just management. For sure. Luckily, we don't have any issues in the facility. Um, and then on the other side of the facility, it's all processing. So we get into post harvest and we have seven drying rooms, um, one solventless lab. Uh, we do hash rosin, bubble hash. Um, and then we send a lot of our trim and shake to partners that blast it for us for hydrocarbon products. Um, and then we have two multi-purpose processing rooms where we just, you know, package cannabis, uh, trim cannabis, uh, then two actual packaging rooms, but we flip the activities around. So the whole, this is just a whole bunch of rooms on this side that uh, every day we actually now release, uh, there's seven different brands that come out of our facility at the moment. We have over a hundred SKUs. So like my processing manager, menu. yeah, my processing man manager is really just, uh, because of health candidate and batch separation, I can't have like two open types of cannabis in a room. So his like just masterminding, like, okay, like pre-rolls in this room that day. And then we're packaging hash in that day. And then we're doing 28 grand bags for that brand. And it's just, he's a mastermind like that, wow. thankfully. Um, and uh, so that's, that's uh, phase one uh, built out. And then we have a phase two that is essentially uh, completed construction with the mechanical and electrical brought in. Uh, but we don't have the walls up and it's just epoxy floor down. I can put another 10 flowering rooms there. Um, and our flowering rooms are uh, 1,850 square feet. Um, and then we have uh, about 1,250 square feet of uh, actual canopy space. Um, and we use top fit, top, uh, top feed, uh, hydroponic, uh, just in rock wool. And we use the Athena, uh, pro system and we have a beautiful, uh, centralized fertigation center, um, uh, which was probably out of all the infrastructure in the facility, which was like, uh, something that took a lot more understanding and scaling up because growing like recirculating DWC, uh, to a million dollar fertigation center, uh, that was interesting, but it's the software is super intuitive. We use this uh, great company called Damatex. Um, so we have two 10,000 gallon freshwater holding tanks, uh, four, um, 4,000 gallon, uh, recipe tanks, and then two stock tanks, which is, we put the Athena concentrated salts in. 
Um, and then any one of those tanks goes through a centralized, um, can go through a manifold and deliver to any table in any room. Um, and uh, the mechanical infrastructure is somewhat unique. Um, we do a glycol heat recovery system and uh, chilling loop. So we have a 500 ton chilling capacity in the glycol system. Um, and that's great because Newfoundland has really cold ambient outdoor temperature. So we actually can use passive uh, cooling as well with that loop. Um, and then when the lights turn off, all the uh, heat that we pick up from the HPS, we re-inject in on the nighttime. Oh, sweet. Have, yeah, exactly. So we have an electronic uh, electric boiler, but it's very small. I think it's like a hundred kilowatts. It barely kicks in because that heat recovery Seven loop out, just yeah. does so well. Um, and then we have two uh, cooling towers, 250 tons each. So there's a thousand tons of uh, cooling online right now uh, for those rooms. We hold set points like a champ. Um, the All the rooms um, are closed loop systems. Like uh, So the air handler um, circulates the entire volume of that room 60 times an hour, goes through HEPA, MERV, and uh, UV filtration. Um, anything leaving the building goes through charcoal. Um, and then all the rooms create positive pressure. So if you have two rooms open at the same time, it'll mix in the hallway, but most likely not uh, go right into another room again for all of our biosecurity uh, reasons. Um, from an IPM standpoint, we've been so lucky. Uh, we have a great IPM manager who's just obsessed with bugs and uh, knows that stuff way better than me. I've been, I've actually been blessed. Um, the team I have around me. Sounds like, like I you have an incredible team. I have, like, I hold the title master grower, but that doesn't exist. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that health can designates that, but like, I have such a team that rounds me out. I would be dead in the water without them. They are everything. And uh, anybody who tells you, you know, that it, it's all like one, one or two people doing this type of stuff, impossible. Um, so my IPM guy, Josh, um, he implemented a, um, uh, beneficial bug program. That's all we use. Um, uh, we've never had, we've had zero pest pressure. Um, that's huge. Yeah. So uh, Cobert, which is the main supplier in Canada for beneficial bugs, uh, came to our facility about two or three weeks ago with their crowd scoping, uh, crowd, uh, crop scouting expert who like they kind of hope they find something, but not really. But, you know, they're trying to do a sales pitch. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so he goes through what's the entire this over place. Here? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, "Oh shit, what's he gonna find?" You know. Yeah. Um, and like, clean bill, hands health. down. Yeah, he was like, ne "Never have ever has, has he ever seen anybody with zero pest pressure? It doesn't exist." He was, so you know, he was like, "Kudos." Now that being said, we got showers here. I make all my staff shower before they go into the plants and everything. Like I am scrub pretty in, regimented. scrub out, shoes for the facility. Totally. Yeah, totally, hundred percent. We do a full uniform. I, I'm just got out of it. The, I'm up in my office upstairs on the grow now. Um, so we do a full laundry service in house. Uh, you know, like it's a way to do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. We take it pretty seriously. Um, so that facility is fully operational now um, in phase one. And uh, we're actually have connected really well with this regional strategy as well. Um, we are the number one licensed producer in our province. 21% of all legal cannabis consumed in our province comes from our facility. Incredible. Um, yeah, which there's no no other licensed producers have market shares like that in other provinces. And I think that is because of how we reflect how our community smokes and we invest in that regionality. Uh, you know, we know the, the how they do it. Well, even going it. back to the brands, Chris, like I, I was not familiar with what a crooked dory was, but <laughs> I'm not your target customer. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like you're building brands that reflect the community that those brands live in. And that's part of the pros of not having cross border sales. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like someone definitely. in BC, they might not know what a crooked dory is. I, I don't know. They, def they definitely, they definitely don't. don't. They definitely All right. don't. I don't know if this is a Canadian thing or just yeah, on the no, East Coast. This is thing. some crazy Newfoundland. Thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's pretty amazing. Um, and all the way yeah. back to your days in California where you saw those regional pockets and, and the flavors and the terps that represented exactly. the taste buds of those area codes. Exactly. And that's, that's the strategy because of my time in Cali, I knew I could do something better here. And there's so much still traction to gain for creating a vibrant, uh, legal cannabis community in Canada. Like we left so many people out of it with legalization that that's the next biggest opportunity. Like 50% of, you know, the smokers out there are still buying legacy products. 
and they want to come in like they you know they there's a value proposition for them it doesn't have to be a certain brand but like there's a smoke for them at the right price and that's one of the biggest things i also learned is that man if i made this company and i thought everybody was going to smoke like me which i did i'd be bankrupt Exotics. long ago exactly yeah. like you know like i'm i'm just crushing like a gram of dabs a day i'm only into like you know the best and uh, nobody else really smokes like that it's just a small percentage um, you're the one percent of kind of exactly, the, the luxury exactly. smokers so you build exactly. value brands for the people. So hundred uh, percent. So if you actually go to the Crooked Dory website, it, it we're very honest. We're like, look, so this is this is also a good point because uh, all these value brands, what we grow, we actually, not a lot of it gets sold into Newfoundland because we command such a, a high price point. It's actually sold across Canada as a, a premium product, uh, 47.99 for three and a half grams plus tax. Um, so we created one Newfoundland brand for the product we grow and we drop the price out of it. Um, and we do a steep volume discount for, if you're getting like 14 and 28 grand bags versus an eighth. So we get some of the legacy people in that way, but the other five brands I have are all purchased B2B because there's other cultivators out there like, uh, that I can honestly, because the wholesale compression and the health of the industry right now is so poor, uh, I can purchase cannabis for 70 and 90 cents. Uh, you know, that's 3% Terps, 25 plus percent THC harvest it recently, um and it's just you can horrible. buy that from the wholesale market yeah not, yes, not yeah. you but someone could like a business could well just just a license holder so i can right. go into the b2b market and this brand explains it like we're newfoundlanders we're going into this market we're shaking everybody's vault down getting the best deal bringing it back home okay. and selling it to you at the right price uh, and we don't hide it. You know, a lot of brands, when they do these white labels and stuff, they're like, oh yeah, like maybe we grow it, maybe we don't. But like, we try to be very honest. This is a white label brand. This yeah. is the value proposition that we offer with this brand. Maybe it's like, you know, like, so- It's transparency. Actually, completely. So this is our brand hierarchy. It's pretty interesting. Um, so Canopy Growth really dominate that bottom value segment across Canada. They have a TWD brand. And uh, so we said- fuck it, we're going down, we're playing with them because they've taken all the market down there. So we buy at a maximum 90 cents a gram uh, from greenhouses typically, and we offer that cannabis because the government markup and excise is outrageous. Uh, they're still getting it. They're still getting a dollar a gram, even though I'm buying it for 90. Wow. Um, don't get me started on that. Yeah. And then <laughs> um, so we sell eighths in that brand for $17 ounces for 99. That's our bottom brand. We compete with them down there. We're the only two locally doing that. And then we have a step up from there, Crooked Dory, uh, $21.99 for an eighth, or then we do 15 grams. We just skip the 14 because there's a 30 gram maximum in Canada. So we get two bags, 30 grams, two flavors, and people go, and it's a value brand at volume. So we sell um, th those 15s for like 60, 62 that flies all day and then we do a five pack of pre-rolls half grams for 17 dollars wow. 20 dollars all in uh so that's one of the biggest brands here that crooked dory and then we go up from there we created two brands that's under one called legacy uh legacy gray and legacy black and just kind of poking fun at the legacy like black market and stuff sure. so we do eighths at that for 27 and then 30 dollars so we got a big spread now on the menu um, and then we grow for gauge. Uh, and so that is product I do actually grow. And we put that in there. That's around $33 for an eighth here in uh, Newfoundland. And then we jump up to our naked mummer, which is also my phenos that came into the legal system with me. Um, so we just cropped some Kush Sorbet, Kate Crasher and Thug Pugs um, Cactus Breath. So that's going to come down and go into that uh, premium priced Newfoundland brand for $39.99 eighth. But if you go up to 15 grams, we want to give an incentive for high volume smokers, typically black market people are trying to attract. This is really good cannabis too. You know, everything about 3% terps, very beautiful phenos, like done right, hand trim, full plant hang dry, no, no quality spared. Um, so we sell 15 grams for that. Um, that medicine is $86. So it's a pretty steep discount from $39.99 on a three and a half. And we figure our packaging strategy is actually different than everybody in Canada there. So the three and a half gram, we only have a maximum of three bud configuration. Uh, typically it gets filled in one or two. So a lot of times it's just like a chunky top that goes in there. 
And then when we're packaging on that line, if any of the buds are bigger than three and a half, most licensed producers break them down. We push it off to the side. And then this brand has a seven gram skew. So this, this seven gram almost has no discount from the three and a half because you're just getting Primo tops in here. Um, and a lot of times you'll open up the seven gram one and it's a seven gram cola, like just a straight top, which doesn't exist in Canada. So we push them off to the side, fill the seven gram, and then we have a 15 gram skew um, that we drop the price out and it's all buds bigger than a gram. It's not smalls. And then uh, we all, we find our people are coming in, grabbing the 15 grammer and then a seven gram flex pack, putting it in a mason jar looks awesome. Um, and uh, nobody else is really doing that part in Canada. Um, so we have another brands above that too, our partners, which I fucking love working with. They got crazy finos. Um, I love growing their turps, um, cookies in Canada. Um, so we sell their, um, eighths in the shop for 47 99, which is above what we're doing. Uh, but you know, that, that comes with the lifestyle brand and the finos that are iconic to cookies. And, you know, I'm, I'd be silly to think that, uh, you know, my, my stuff has got the notoriety at this point. So. I want to tell you again about Athena Nutrients. They offer a full range of liquid and powdered nutrients, integrated pest management solutions, and sanitizing and disinfecting products that were researched and developed specifically for use in large-scale cannabis production. The Athena Clean line is their newest range of products, and they are a cultivator's first line of defense against pathogens, pests, mildew, and other fungal issues. The three-part system cleans, sanitizes, and disinfects both irrigation lines and hard surfaces. And it's a great solution for any scale cultivation. Reset your room to its full potential with Clean Line from Athena Nutrients. To learn more, visit them on Instagram at athena.ag or on their website at athenaag.com. What's it like working with Burner and Cookies? So I don't get uh, FaceTime with the, the cookies like California crew. Um, I, I had a DM from Burner once because I'm a bit of a fanboy. Don't get me wrong. Because especially from growing up in like uh, the Cali early Prop 215 era. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, sure you guys crossed paths at some point. Man, maybe because like at the dispos you used to like be a bud tender at, I used to go to, you know, and when I left like Girl Scout cookies, the forum cut and shit, mm -hmm. just like people like, oh, what is that? Where's it coming from? So I left in like 2013 and stuff. So I was like looking at that from afar and building this and uh, just love the brand, man. Like love, love everything is done. Love his music. And uh, so how I actually got linked into Cookies Canada was uh, there's a few homies here, um, Ziad, Yusuf and Rami. Rami is the founder of Gage. So he founded it, one of the founders in Canada and brought it to Michigan. Um, so he knows Burner and all the guys like that the guys got linked up with me because I told, I haven't told many people in Canada, my California story, because it's a pretty tight market here. You go through a security clearance and I didn't know if it would affect my clearances. Now I'm fully cleared. So I tell everybody. They might hear it um, now on this podcast. I know, I know, man. That was <laughs> leading up to this. I was like, oh man, how much do I tell? But like, I, I talked to my lawyer and stuff. Tell like, all, you're, baby. you're not charged, you know? So, yeah. um, and I got my shit now. So anyways, I tell people and I like it, but I told Rami that story or someone who introduced me to Rami and Rami, I'm not telling his story, but Rami's got a story, you know what I mean? So we were chopping it up and uh, met his two brothers. And uh, I just like, there's a lot of different partners you can have in Canada. You can have bankers who are like these dudes that are just like from like CPG, like alcohol, mostly running bullshit and trying to just raise money and rip off people with bad smoke and mids. Or you can find the real ones like Rami, like Ziad and Yusuf and they brought cookies to Canada and they came and visited my facility while it was under construction. So this is like, they had a lot of faith in me. They're like, dude, we're going to wait till you build this thing. Cause like they, they had my medical grow shit. So like all my phenos, I was hunting for years. They, they used to taste that stuff before I got licensed. Um, and uh, so they had faith. And then, um, you know, they, they saw the facility built and then we were like the first grower for cookies that they, they went with basically. And now we're majority of our rooms are filled with cookies, Finos. Um, and that was a lot of pressure to be honest, like as well. Cause like the first crops obviously had to be bangers, you know, and, uh, this is ramping up a facility. 50,000 square foot facility, 12 grow rooms, you know, like dialing everything in. 
Um, and we actually, uh, we did some really good crops. Um, and the bag appeal was stellar. The potency was super high. The terpenes were through the roof. It was over 4% on this crop, uh, the first cookies one. And uh, so the guys flew down and saw it. Now there's some crazy shit in Canada, which is all backwards. You can't smoke your weed generally before the public gets it. Okay. So at this point I was newly licensed and there was no way to smoke this cannabis. You couldn't and I was, try it? No. So fully harvest it, two week, full plant hang dry, full of terps, beautiful bag appeal, all hand trimmed, looks amazing like and then i'm just drooling trying to want to smoke this stuff and i was playing it by the book because i just i'm just newly licensed you know i'm not fucking with health canada and uh so it gets to market in another province i'm not in before i ever smoke it how is that possible that's the entire canadian supply chain now i have a way around that now we actually have a research and development license that we just got which like now I can release internally to do like R and D. Yeah, exactly. And like that we're just got. So that took fucking forever. Uh, and before that we had to game plan it where I was a medical patient. So, so we had to put this in place because we released this to market and I used a nutrient system I never used before because the one I had previously been using, you couldn't scale up. It was, uh, they didn't have a salt option and I couldn't buy water and send it halfway across the country. Too expensive. It was too much. So I was using, does it matter if I just throw out people I'm using and blast them? Like, or should I not like this? Like, this is. Hey, this is like, your story. I'm okay. not going to censor anything. Okay, cool. So YouTube MJ Plant, might censor us, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. MJ Plant Prod uh, was cheap, but w paid the ultimate fucking price because by the time it got to a smoker's I've hand. I've never even heard of that. Yeah, it's like Plant Prod's the company and it's their MJ line and it's all hmm. salt. Is that Canadian? Super cheap. It, I think it's a big Canadian thing and I never heard of them either, right? Like they were just, we were moving so quick uh, and I couldn't use the stuff I wanted. And Athena wasn't actually in Canada at this point. They weren't even allowed to be brought in. It was ridiculous because um, that has to go through this whole CFIA certification That's and stuff. Right. And uh, so we get this, we crop out all looks banger and then it smokes like shit it's fucking got black ash and i'm like are you fucking kidding me like this is my entire life my entire dream like everything like i i i am a walking fucking cookies billboard i have a walk-in closet of cookies you know You're wearing this is our cookies first right crop. now man like i got cookie sandals on like you know like i got cookie <laughs> my socks Gucci my cookie flip -flops. Sandals. exactly like um Jumps, and yeah. uh, track suit and the cookie flip-flops ex exactly exactly is what i'm in and uh so like that was devastating and then we put a something in place i, I switched the nutrients immediately which was the biggest thing how did thing, you which know is like, because of the black ash you're like okay you identify so i looked at the like, when we did a week flush still like we actually some of the crops were eight and nine days which is typically longer than i go in rock wool and uh, the ecs were totally uh way down uh the runoffs were great um and then i when the first crop harvest it got to market i started taking samples and send it to a lab to do a nutrient assay test on it and the smart. pk levels uh were still really high on it so this uh finishing part of the MJ plant prod system just gets too crazy with the past potassium and phosphorus. And it's just, I think that had to do with it. Um, or it was just a bad chelation, like the chelation technology they were using I may have done it. Like I was doing some reading that could have been part of it, but it was garbage and I'm never going to use it again. Um, and I was dev sales. Like, how do I recover from this? Because all the crops are now, I had like six rooms of going in mid cycle. Some of it was like, harvested on it and then i decided to flip and some rooms were just going into flower on it and i was going into my second cycle at this big facility and i changed the nutrients i said fuck it i was like the crops are going to hate it but i can't i cannot have shit that burns like that that's not who i am and uh, so we made the decision got athena in here switched right away Smart and immediately move. immediately um even flipping halfway through the nutrients which plants obviously hate white ash was fixed on the first crops. It's like, oh, thank God, you know, like, uh, and I, we even ha hadn't even done from clone to harvest. We hadn't done a full Athena run yet. So I was like, it can only get better. Um, so we're running with that. And now we're just going through our third round of all eight rooms being harvested. And uh, oh my God, like Athena, they share so much information and give so much support to my team. They just call them up all the time. They chop it up, they shoot the ship and like talk the same language. 
and they give solutions and they, and even on just their social media and their Instagram, like they are so free sharing men, like they give up the knowledge, which is what it's all about. Like holding all that stuff in, yeah. just, you know, why. Brandon's the G their whole team, man, amazing. And they completely change our game. And then this is also what I'll say. I've been growing the same way, regardless of what receptacle or delivery of hydroponic nutrients since 2008, like you know, I'm doing Nebula's defoliation technique since like 2008, you know, I'm defoliating when I go into flower on day 21 and I'm picking away the leaves, like at the last few weeks, you know, like typical stuff. And I didn't do much different, like my PPMs and the EC, I was generally controlled, hitting like totally before and, and after. I didn't exactly so the facility was growing that way we when we went to athena and we were just hammering nutrients we had a high runoff then uh like crazy runoff just to like we just had to get through to the next crop and then i started reading about crop steering for the first time i was like what the fuck is crop steering i was like oh my god like you know like like this is the new talk now and then i saw athena posting all this support for crop steering and i was looking at like First of all, the, the Athena is scary at first because the EC at the tank level uh, is crazy. You know, like you're starting at three EC, like right at right in the veg. Our clones get 1.5 EC, no rooting hormone. The best thing we ever did, stop using rooting hormone, 1.5 EC of corn bloom, uh, soak the rock wool, stick it, forget it, roots in 12 days, no chlorosis, like beautiful looking clones. So anyways, um, uh, we start doing crop steering. And so our yields on that second run, when we went from plant prod to Athena, grams per square foot went way down. Obviously the plants weren't loving that, but at least it started burning white and I had some really nice burning product. And then the cookie shit that I was growing was all burning white again too. It was good. My yields were way below expectations. I had um, one, two rooms come in around 55, 52 and 56 grams per square feet. I had like 78 lights in there and 1300 square foot canopy. It was way underperforming. Um, and my financial model and our expectations was like a minimum of like 65 grams per square foot. And we did that thinking we could beat it in most cases. Um, so anyways, now we get into crop steering, which, you know, is really understanding the root health in vegetative and generative phases and and really the control of your media to have uh controlled drybacks and stacking the ec extremely high and it like i was so afraid because like you know the guys at athena are like you know get up the field saturation get no runoff and then you do like you know you want like a nine percent dry back every like hour and a half and then a few days into that your media ec sometimes you know 10 12 13 ec no burn on the plants, nothing. These things just love it. So we started doing this EC stacking and the crop steering um, and our yields. We just took down two rooms. One of them was 98 grams per square foot, then 86 grams per square foot, and then 70, like three or 74 in the last three rooms. Like, I mean, like drastic increases. And, you know, the product is is beautiful. It's phenomenal. Um so I can't say I'm, I'm taught like a, like a, I'm not paid by Athena. I can tell you that, <laughs> but uh, like it changed my game up. And I was so devastated with that pressure of our first crop and the Canadian regulations, not letting me smoke it for anybody else did that saved my entire high stakes. And, and this system was maybe four times more expensive uh, per bag. But like I, if I could go back in time, that is the one thing I regret. And I would have used from day one, if I could have, um, because some people don't get, you're only as good as your next crop. Right. And when your first crop, uh, has that issue, like that was devastating. I was, I was broken, um, for a while, but now like the, the stuff we're making now is it's the best in Canada. Like nobody's, nobody is doing this stuff. Like we're, we're killing it now. Like our cheetah piss crops, uh, are flying across Canada now. Uh, we just brought down um, some Gary Payton uh, on the new Athena nutrients. Just smells amazing, man. The cherry pie uh, in the background in the uh, it's one of the, in the lineage in the grow rooms is so fucking loud. It's just crazy cherry terps. Then it finishes up uh, with almost like this burnt tire like uh, nose on it. I love it. Um, what else do we got going for them? We have Lion's Mane, uh, Banana Bread by Gage. Um, Any lemonade, Finos? Um, I don't have actually, so uh, Lion's Mane's under Lemonade. Okay. Um, and the guys do Medellin. Um, mm. I haven't grown that one. Our partners do. So there's the two facilities, uh, the Retta brothers I was talking about have their facility as well. And then uh, we grow for them. So we split the strains up. So we're not oh, um, cool. you know, overlapping each other and stuff. 
Um, but they're actually just about to send me some Medellin for my stores. I love that, man. Like it's a sick nose on that. Um, and uh, well, we got some cool stuff coming like gelati, helium, laughing gas, E85. It's all, all the bedrooms now. Okay. So logistically speaking, how does your product make it across Canada? Like how, how does yeah. the system work? Yeah, totally. So all 10 provinces have one board. Generally it's like there are a lot of them, it's their liquor board and they, they do product calls. So every so many times a year, if you have all your licenses, you can submit a product to a product call, show them the SKUs you want, the potential price, any sales data, if you're from another province. Um, so when I was first licensed, it's a two part system. You get your cultivation license, but then you have to grow two times, two batches, go through the full cycle, have health Canada come to your facility physically, do an audit, and then they give you a sales license. When you get the sales license, then you answer to a product call and become a vendor directly. So I didn't have a sales license at first, but Noya, my partner who brought cookies to Canada did. So they were vendor registered. So they would send me, you know, all the packaging uh, and I, I would, you know, we'd collaborate on the production schedule. We would crop, get it trimmed. And then they would tell us which province it was being excised for. There's a different stamp for every province. And then uh, we would either stamp it and send it to a province for them. Uh, they would virtually release it for us and say, you know, this is our processing facility and partner. They're going to ship it to your warehouse. Here you go. Or now we're fully licensed. So in some provinces, we deliver the product as well directly to our stores in the warehouse locally. Um, but generally we send it to them bulk in Ontario, which is more central. And then uh, they send it out to the different provinces in BC and Ontario and on the medical markets. And uh, I supply all of Newfoundland. And there's software that can get you data back of what's being sold oh, yeah. and all Hell that yeah. good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So we're doing really good actually in Newfoundland. So it's um, our financial expectations for cookies we kept it pretty conservative because I'm in a small province and it's a little more economically depressed here, but we have a huge like alcohol and tobacco and cannabis consumption per capita. Uh, so I knew there, that there was real smokers here that was going to like love what we had to do, but was I going to get them out of the, the legacy market or not? So we kept that pretty small expectation and we're doing like 30 or 40% more um, in premium sales. So in the last two and a half years of cannabis retailing, cookies has completely blown up any expectation I have for premium. I think in, um, and again, this is a small part of it. Our stores will do um, about 17 million this year uh, in our local retail network, not not like including, like we sell to all the other stores yeah. as well, but just my stores. Other stores. Um, and in the last five weeks, we've sold $195,000 of uh, cookies eighths because they, they they just do one gram cones and, and three and a half gram bags. Uh, so you know, when you're at a high price point and just have those two SKUs, it generally is slower moving in Canada. Um, but we're killing it now. Like people are coming into our stores and they love that. Like Canadian legalization is void of that culture. It's like, like California is the Mecca, like anything that you can do to like bring that culture into Canada or create Canada's own culture as well. Like that's, that's what this industry needs. Cause it's, it's fucking sterile right now here. Totally. What, what are the inner workings of, uh, basically a cultivation deal with cookies? You know, yep. not a lot of people know it's not super public. I've filmed a couple facilities like Redwood Cultivation out of Nevada um, yep. in Vegas. They have a, a cookies cultivation um, agreement. Yeah. But how does it work in, in your opinion and your experience? Man, I was so happy to do it because obviously the Cali connection and I was an opportunity to really bring lifestyle brands closer to Canada. And that's what I'm all about. So it fit me and the company's strategic vision. And it really closed a loop where I thought I like, I'm not like religious and stuff, but like at one point I thought I was put on this earth when all of this collided and I started actually doing this in Canada and started actually fucking with cookies and brought the, the culture here. I was like, man, like, I was like, this is, this is it, you know? Um, so they helped me feel that way. And I have mad respect for that. Like I would never, you know, I, I would die for that shit. Um, and, uh, how it works is very fair. I don't know how it works in, in the United States. It's probably very different. It's two very different industries, but my partners with cookies, Canada and the Retta brothers, um, 
it's a joint venture, man. Like we split profit. Like we, we take out, we get product to market. We collaborate, uh, you know, every week we're back and forth every day, but every week it's official. Um, and, uh, we take all of our costs out on both sides, uh, on, on, you know, they, they do a whole bunch and like I do they're not charging growing. for packaging and stuff like that. No, exactly. Like or they'll the, send the me Gucci flip flops. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So like they, they send all, like all the supply chain stuff, you know, yeah. comes from their place. I got thousands of lemonade bags, gauge bags, cookies bags, um, the RTJ bags for run the jewels that got discontinued. Um, they supply all of that. They supply the phenos which is like yeah that's the big everything. part of it right you know so like genetics. they got the phenos sick genetics uh and it's the real shit you know i don't know how they go about doing that and i don't want to know but i know it's the real stuff uh because gary's gary you can spot it from a mile away just the pistols and the, the bud uh flower morphology of it and the terps obviously um so uh, then we just take all of our costs out and it's an open book transparent relationship and we just split profit you know wow which is a great opportunity. Like not only am I investing in bringing these amazing cultivars with a solid team to Canada to change up the game here. Like there's, there's also a certain elevation you get, I think as well as just being part of the family that way, you know, That's like, right. uh, I think like if they have faith in me to still allow me to grow and do this. And I even had one bad crop and there won't be any more, you know, like I'm only as good as the next one, but I promise that shit's first behind one's me. a mulligan exactly exactly 100 percent. just getting it dialed in it makes sense yeah. i i don't remember off the top of my head but can you remind me the affiliation between cookies and gauge like did yeah did cookies acquire gauge like what what's going on there um so i don't i, I don't 100 know this is what I, I this is what i, f I think is how it works anyway so gauge was actually a canadian brand which a lot of people don't know they oh. brought it over to michigan i saw them in uh, michigan a year ago exactly so they there. blew up in michigan a couple of years ago and, and i the spoke main with retailer. oh fuck awesome dude so rami brought it over there and he has some homies that just uh did gauge with him there um, and then they got connected with um terrasend essentially so terrasend purchased uh gauge ah. Yeah. And so now Terrasend owns the right to gauge. Terrasend is operating in Canada and the United States. Their focus, I think, is more on the MSO side now, staying stateside. There's a bit more money there than Canada at the moment. Um, but uh, they, I believe, um, like maybe like somehow they're involved with bringing, I think, Cookies Canada as well. But it's Rami's relationship with them, like Rami uh you know brought that deal together that family so uh through that somehow he also knows burner and all the guys too and um they they're one of the first license holders in canada this is an amazing family so it's a first generation um lebanese family and they have like convenience stores all over hamilton ontario and they just grind you know like they're like some of the best people ever man like i've met in this industry and uh so they they you know they knew how to work and then they did this thing in Michigan and then they got Noya licensed um I think it was like the 23rd license holder in Canada there's 900 of us now so they were early days um and uh you know the whole industry's changed since then and I'm sure their company's changed over and over um but they're the real ones in Canada like there's a lot of fakers but they're real and I think that's honestly how they got cookies to Canada like in like the large part of it from what I saw out in the Michigan market, it looked like Gage was the first one to bring Gary Payton and, and a lot of those yes. phenos that you're growing to the Michigan market. And yeah. I thought they had some sort of almost they like do, actually. they were yeah. the Atlantic cultivation of Michigan, right? So they, you are right. In the United States, uh, there are states, uh, Michigan is one of them, where Terrasend now owns Gage and Cookies, right? So if you go into right. a Cookies, kind of uh, Gage, exactly. If you roll, go into a Gage shop, a lot of them are always Gage and Cookies now. And Terrasend, I believe, owns the rights to both of those in Michigan. I don't know if it's probably different state by state. I, I, I'm pretty bad with some of the state stuff because I'm just – uh, wrapped up in my own bubble, you know? Yeah. So what, what's next for Chris? What's next for Atlantic, everything that you yeah. have going on, what's on the horizon, man. Um, so we got to push the market share here again. Everything for me is this regional play where it's my home base and we use, we have this amazing relationship with cookies to be on our national platform 
um, to get to the other provinces, but I'm still not at market saturation here, which is crazy. Like I'm going to do more than 21% of all cannabis consumed in this province. I want to get to like 30% of all cannabis between my brand hierarchy that I was going through. Um, and then that naked mummer brand that we have, uh, just, I don't even, I'm pretty like not specific. That brand could even change, but the product we grow that are my phenos for Newfoundland that are super premium. I need, that's the next step. I need to find market saturation for that product. Like how much, um, killer product, like how much fire can I move and what's the price it has to be to get all of the legacy consumers into the legal market, find my peak market share in my region, build up this base. Um, and then also a large part of what we're growing is helping the cookies brand go across Canada. So they're growing. Like it's, a lot of people, like people in Canada still don't even know what cookies is, you know, like it's different, like, like, like Sherbinsky's here and he, they work with uh, another group in Canada that are super cool. Um, and they got Sherb pens and like nobody in Canada even knows who Sherbinsky is, man. Like they're like, oh, this is a cool looking vape pen. It's orange. It's <laughs> yeah. an orange vape pen, you know? When they see the and, orange uh, and blue hues, they don't know the brands to represent. They don't them. know. They don't know yet. Like people are catching on. So that's my commitment too. Like I'm going to grow cookies in Canada with my homies, my business partners. They're going to keep getting uh, that good weed and they're, you know, that good medicine and they're going to start expanding their provinces they're in bc um they're in manitoba they're in newfoundland and ontario but there's still plenty of provinces we need to get into you know quebec and alberta so i'm, I'm dedicated to keep that production capacity for them um to, to make the cookies brand successful while also figuring out my market share here saturation point um and you know maybe in the future if you know in an optimistic scenario i can put so much premium cannabis into newfoundland uh maybe i have to take back a room uh to fill that demand and, and that is a priority i'm very open with with my partners there and they respect that uh, but we are in a small province Five hundred thousand people is small so i do need to utilize this base and this community that we're building uh but i knew i do need to go to other provinces through the cookies brand because they do take a large part of the supply that i buy or i sell uh, that we grow and uh, we'll also get our brands in other provinces as well. Um, people, I'm, I'm starting to come somewhat like, well, like not well known, but because of the cookies thing and because I'm very open to my social media, um, I walk to my facility every day. I'm in every single room. I'm talking to everybody. I show people exactly what we do. You know, like I'm, I have no fear in showing the processes we do. It's a clean facility and I welcome everybody to ask me questions and all of that. So because of that, I've definitely gotten a bit of a following that just like to see the inside workings of a facility. And we've had provinces approach me a fair bit trying to get our own product to there uh, that we have in Newfoundland. So at some point we'll do that as well. But until I've reached market saturation here in Newfoundland, make cookies as successful as they can be nationally, um, very quickly to that, we'll be getting my brand in some of those provinces as well. And, uh, you know, I just want to be like, create this family of partners and brands that care about smokers and the culture. That's what I want to do. Like, you know, and it's going to start here because it impacts, I got the biggest impact here, but I want to spread that across Canada um, because we're dry here on that. Yeah. And ultimately that's, what's going to be a, attracting a lot of these legacy smokers, right? Like you said, one of your biggest problems of getting yeah. to that point is, you know, they're, they're just not going into a dispensary yet. I think that will change. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's more education, more culture, um, becoming more and more synonymous with the, with the lifestyle, like the cookies lifestyle, right. Or yeah, being Cali yeah. sober. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. It, it's an education thing. I mean, um, what do you see for uh, the future of Canadian cannabis as being one of the biggest operators there? Um, it is difficult the road forward for so many is not you know for for everybody it's not what it was okay so there's about 900 license holders at the moment i predict 50 to 60 percent of those will be bankrupt in the next year to 18 months Whoa. um so this is a crazy statistic it's not uh, i didn't look it up but there's a really well-known um, lawyer named trina fraser in canada who specializes in cannabis um, last week, she pulled out a stat that 49% of all CCAA filings federally, so for the entire country of Canada, all bankruptcy filings, 49% of them have been cannabis companies. Yeah. Um, so that's where it's going. Like the same problem. It's great 
because I got the, the vertical like integration and when I can buy a compressed wholesale market at 90 cents a gram and sell it in my store, like that works for very few of us. And I'm taking advantage of a on sustainable, on tenable uh, opportunity, which is just this economic, just downward compression on the wholesale where nobody, people are selling under cost uh, just for cash flow. They're just cash recovering, trying to make payroll. And the only group that is making any money in Canada is the federal and provincial governments. And until that blood in the water happens, unfortunately, because it is about to be an absolute bloodbath. It is going to be horrible. So many passionate people, because there are some out there are going to lose their jobs, their vision, everything. If I lose this, it's all I have. You know, Can you bring them um, into your fold? We lobby within our sphere of influence, I think effectively and have very great open, transparent relationships with our provincial government. I don't have that ability necessarily to do it federally. That's obviously much more difficult. There are cannabis um groups out there i'm looking at joining um uh, i just talked to the president of tilray the other day and um i'm looking at joining the cannabis council of canada to help spread this message as well from an operator at my size um compared to some of the big boys but you know we need an effective lobbying strategy um and a face to bring this message in the most uh, effective way to the federal government because at this point i don't think any change is happening quick enough and there's going to be a so many jobs lost from this. Um, you know, I don't know if that's going to change, but ultimately, uh, this is the big burden. Okay, federal excise tax. Okay, let's talk about two buckets of it. Federal excise tax for flour in Canada. Federal excise tax is fixed pricing for one dollar a gram. So let's put one instance I had that almost bankrupted this company. So. Uh, we get excise stamps given to us. They go into a vault. They're just as precious as cannabis because if they get lost, you can get fined and you will also be bankrupt just from that. And then you'll get your CRA license from the federal government taken away from you. So you protect these things like gold. It's a stamp? Um, it's a little stamp that says which of the 10 provinces and you put it on the seal where a cannabis bag rips and it validates that this is a legal cannabis product, basically. So it's a federal stamp. And this stamp, we take it, let's say I have a three and a half gram of the mint soap, okay? Um, this is going to Ontario out of province for me. This provincial board has a big warehouse and they have 60 day payment terms, okay? So I crop a full room of the soap and I have four, 5,000, maybe more units. The POs can get much bigger than that. Um, every three and a half gram bag I fill in this incident incidents, uh, I owe the federal government $3.50 in 30 days. So all of the provincial territories have payment terms for the most part that are double or more than what you owe when you use one of these stamps to the federal government. There's been times when we have $1.95 million in working capital cannabis out there on receivables, but we've paid the tax to the federal government already. You know, it's just the cash flow is not even horrendous. And like, why wouldn't there be a level of coordination between federal and provincial payment terms with excise versus uh, distributorship? You know, it's, it's just horrible for the supply chain and yeah, anybody. So that's one issue. Then there's no proportionality to it. So if I have this value brand where I'm selling $99 ounces, I paid, that's fixed. I paid 90 cents for somebody for this grand. If I want to eliminate the black market, how am I supposed to do that? When I pay 90 cents a gram, I can use my economy of scale to flood people out price-wise on the black market, but the federal government still wants a dollar a gram. So I really can't, like I'm paying more in taxes at that point at, at bulk, you know what I mean? So it's like, by the time I get it down and then into the province and the province has a markup as well, it's so disproportionately priced compared to the 90 cents because there's a dollar to the feds and a 41% markup factor in our province, the province takes. Um, so, you know, by the time it gets to the consumer, it's no cheaper than a lot of black market options. And so there it doesn't you go. matter. It's, it's what I said earlier, I thought it was more of a cultural thing. It's a price thing. It's a price thing uh, for a lot of it. They're going to continue know. to buy just as good if, you know, in yeah, some cases, small exactly. batch, higher quality at totally, a lower price totally, point. Totally. And the, the homey hookup. 
Exactly. And those prices are, are we're, there is compression on the legacy market. Like people are buying like cutie pies and QPs for like, like 100, 100, 200, 200 bucks, you know, like they're just the moms online are just giving away ounces at this point. They're all sub 100 bucks. So um, we are seeing that price war affected, but people are taking losses in the legal cannabis side, basically selling product for under their production costs because the people I'm buying for 70 and 90 cents from, they, they're taking write downs. It's impossible. Their, their biological asset to cultivate to that point and sell it was below 90 cents. It's, some of these are indoor facilities, for example. So it doesn't matter if it's a $60 eighth for cookies or a $20 eighth. The feds in 30 days are getting three and a half dollars a package for that eighth, the three and a half grams. Um, and so that's one part of it. Now, this is something that was very real two weeks ago. So I have this value brand, Crooked Dory. So let's talk about concentrates. I do bubble hash here. Um, I have a cheap shatter and a cheap wax uh, and a rosin as well. So uh, the hydrocarbons I don't do in-house. I do all my own solvent lists. So, you know, we got tons of shake in the vault. I'm packaging for six different brands with about 5% wastage. I'll take all that shake and do a really cheap full spectrum bubble hash, you know, like a 160 to 45 wash, uh, nothing special. Um, we sell it for $15, $17 a gram plus tax. So we did a wash and these are some of the oldest trichomes in the vault. I thought this was going to be like some boo-boo hash, you know, good for your old pappy, like old man type stuff, you know, <laughs> not like new stuff, but there's a market here like for that as well. Yeah, so you sure. still make it. Um, and I figured 50% at most, maybe 55, you know? So we're washing it, get it out of the freeze dryer, send it off for testing, comes back at fucking 72%. So the reason why that's such a bad issue, it shouldn't be. Consumers should be happy because I'm going to sell it for the same price no matter what. I have a skew from the board and I can't change the price on that skew. It's fixed. Right? It's fixed. So you have a ceiling. Um, exactly. So now let's ex let's explain how excise works for concentrates. It's not fixed. It's scalable, but disproportionately punitive. So you have a thousand milligrams of THC potential in one gram of product. Okay. So let's say this was 55%. I owe the federal government one cent per milligram. So 50% THC is 500 milligrams. I was expecting to pay federal tax of $5, maybe $5.50. But because I pulled a good, a better wash, the trichome heads, the trichome heads just caught better at that micron, more potency, more heads, better product for the consumer. Uh, but I have to now pay an extra two dollars and twenty cents because it came out uh, twenty percent, some odd more. It doesn't and incentivize gotta, you to create a better product. Exactly, and my price is fixed, so that was my margin. Like that two dollars yeah. there was actually my profit margin, right? So now the feds just took it because I ran a cleaner batch. Right. Like, like how in the world of concentrates does that even add up? Right. It just doesn't like it's, it's insane. Is there an ability to change these laws? I'm going to a lobbying event, um, the fourth year legalization, um, October of this year. Um, we're going to go to, uh, Ottawa and uh, government buildings there. And somebody is organizing a lobbying event there. This is where, um, I don't even have enough opinion to give this, but I do know enough players in our cannabis industry that there's a lot of people that, you know, they faked it till they made it, or they're just a bunch of shitty fucking Wall Street, like Bay Street bankers that I wouldn't, you know, use them to convince any of these politicians. And I wonder who is really heading up these lobbying efforts, because I know how we're doing it here and we're doing it very professionally here and we're making incremental changes within my province. Um, but I think more can be done um, with the message federally. I'm not convinced it's being done accurately because I don't know why the federal government, they know this, they see the CCAA filings. They know the distress the industry is in. W what is not happening? It, like They're not like, coming to know, help. Exactly. Yeah. So something more has to happen. Um, and I'm definitely going to start now getting more involved with it, but uh, we're also fighting for local changes too. Like, so my province has some backward stuff too. So vape pens, we're one of the only provinces. They just banned vape pens. You remember like a couple of years ago um, when the vitamin E acetate vape bullshit gate. was going? 
man, like, and it was all just like tobacco bullshit. And it was like, and it was people cutting with emulsifiers, yeah. right? So in health Canada, you generally can't use any of those agents. No, no, none of the, uh, like the alcohols and stuff that are in, um, in the, like tobacco vape pens, like PGV and all that stuff. Like you can't use those in our vapes. Uh, so they're generally safe. You know, you could put bio, you can put botanically derived terpenes in there that are non-cannabis. And if you go too high on terpenes, they are solvents. Maybe you could fuck up a formulation, uh, but there's generally zero risk with vape pens in Canada because they don't have all that crap allowed in it in the first place. Um, but we banned vape pens and that's like 17, the lowest province right now is 15% participation in that category for the total revenue generated by legal cannabis sales. We, as a province where I live, are not even participating in that. And you can get vape pens everywhere. I can go to like a uh, homie's hydroponic store and he's just like mixing up carts because why wouldn't he be <laughs> like, you know, um, and that's stupid, you know, like this mandate federally and provincially to allow safe access to medicine um, doesn't work under banning products like it's just you're creating an illicit market and demand right. so it just makes zero sense like there's no legs to stand on for that and it was really about this this hype and energy at the time and they made the decision that was nonsensical it was you know people looking at contaminated vape pens in the black market in california some report came out and then you know, making and, a law in canada based on it exactly yeah so um lots of small battles like that but the biggest one is that excise until the federal government realizes what's uh, and they do realize but until that changes nothing's going to happen um so like that's drastically changed our projection as a company too you know i wasn't on like a lot of people when i got my investment team together i had a big rosy picture you know my pnl statement looked like we were printing fucking buku bucks by now uh, and the whole industry didn't do that so like you know they understand that now they know that you know no one's getting in and out of this industry. We're in it for a long term. I always was like, this is my life. Um, and thankfully, my investors are here for that long road here now. But there's nobody getting out uh, on scathe at this point. And some people just are getting out with nothing, unfortunately, uh, when, when it all falls down. But we are uh, different. And I like uh, this month, there's a chance that we actually, you know, I'm getting kind of in the board sees this that might be a little pissy with me, but uh, like we're going to go cash flow positive this month or next month. Like we're, we're at that precipice now where we've basically almost stemmed all the bleeding. Uh, but I can't tell you what the team and I do. And we do it differently like than everybody in Canada because one, we're vertically integrated. We care so much about the community. Um, and you know, like we just grow different. It's better than everybody else's to be honest. So like, I know we're going to push through and survive. Um, and we're about to, I think be the first company in Canada to say that they're cash flow positive. And, um, I may have heard, um, event brands, um, uh, posted in their last quarter that they've gone cash flow positive, um, Norton and his team up there are killing it as well. They're a publicly traded company, but they actually, uh, grow some fire and care about smokers. Um, but you know, we'll be the first or second in Canada to even like say that we did that now, like return on investment when you have a $32 million facility, I'm not even thinking about that, but I mean, that's where I got to get to at some point. I promised my investors that would be there. Um, you can pull but, the Amazon you know, card with your board. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, but there is upside, like things will change. And what other industry is 50% of our consumers out there going to come in, they're coming in, you know, they're going to come over from legalization at some point. And then our, that's not a lot of effort we even had to put into it, to be honest. Like, you know, like, it's not like we need to get people to like to smoke uh, medicine, you know, like these people are going to come in uh, in 10 years or whatever it takes. But like, if you look at illicit, like tobacco and alcohol, that's not really a thing here anymore, you know? So I'm still very optimistic on the cannabis industry that we survive and we focus on our region and our and our local smokers and then something's got to change something's got to give at that federal level um but we're going to rebuild something that's beautiful i can tell you that and i'm going to be here to help do that and uh, i think the real ones will but there's going to be some bankers that have a 300 million dollar war chest as well that are waiting for this and they're they're perpetuating it they want the race to the bottom to get there so one of their last companies standing exactly yeah um greedy when others gonna, are fearful 
exactly there's going to be those guys out there uh and there's going to be operators like myself and the homies that uh you know, Rami Retta and stuff and uh it's going to be interesting to see what we shape this cannabis industry to be but it's only going to get better from what it is right now 100 percent. well chris i'm rooting for you there's a whole lot of people rooting for your success um i appreciate you sharing your story with us yeah, today man. and um, hopefully one day we can head up there and film your operation. I would love that. I would love that. And I would roll out the whole red carpet. Yeah. We will go whale watching in Newfoundland, dude, go on a tour. Let's do sick. it. We'll, we'll yeah. go out there on a crooked dory. I yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't exactly. know if that's a whale watching boat, but it's a little small, but we'll stay away from the whales. <laughs> we'll, we'll get pretty crooked on that dory though. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chris. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for tuning in today on the Canna Cribs podcast, brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have six categories you want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting off with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticulture Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Climate Control by Quest, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and helping us bring more knowledge to your garden. If you want to support the Can of Cribs podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. And while you're there, hit us up on Instagram. Hit us up on the Growers Network Forum. We have thousands of growers all around the world on both our Instagram and our forum, just like you, looking to elevate their craft. Happy growing.